Good morning. Our text today is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 27. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says to his disciples that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus' authority is God's authority because he is the Son of God. He's proven that fact many times. You'll remember when Jesus met with a centurion who um, asked him to come and heal his servant. And Jesus was about to go with him. And the centurion said to Jesus, I'm a man under authority. And I say to this one, come. And he comes. And to that one, go. And he goes. All you need to do, basically, is just say the word. And I know my servant will be made well. And Jesus proves his authority by doing just that. He says, look at this great faith. Well, what was it faith in? It was faith in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and that he has the authority to do, uh, you know, even a miracle, even something that no one else on earth was able to do because the centurion believed that Jesus is the Lord. As I said, he's proven that many times throughout the gospel. But in our text today, we see his enemies attempt to question and dispute his authority to their own detriment. And so as we always do at the beginning of our time together, let us pray now for the Lord to open up our hearts and minds to receive his word and to believe it and to believe the truth about who he is and the authority that he really does have over everything, including our lives. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your great love for us. For though you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, you also humbled yourself and became a servant and put on human flesh because of your love, because of the Father's love. And you reconciled us to yourself through your life and death on the cross. We are so grateful for that, Lord. And we recognize your authority over us. We recognize your authority over the entire universe. And I pray now that through the power of your holy word, which is living and active, that it would come into our hearts and enliven us. And that you would use it to draw us to yourself to draw us into a, a deeper knowledge of you, a deeper and greater and higher acknowledgement of who you are and the authority that you really do have. Lord, maybe we believe that you have authority, but maybe it's at times hard for us to express that even in our own obedience. And we might even sometimes say, Lord, Lord, and do not obey you. But help us now to obey you, Lord, to acknowledge your authority, your authority not only in our words, but also in our actions and our lives. Help me to speak your word today and help us to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 21, verses 23 to 27. And when he entered the temple... The chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these 
things. As we learned a couple of weeks ago, Jesus acted out a sort of living parable in his cursing of the fruitless fig tree. Just as the fig tree deceptively appeared to be fruitful, but wasn't, so many of the religious leaders of Jesus' day were the same way. They had appearance without substance. They were, in other words, hypocrites. And we see in our text in verse 23 that these same sorts of leaders approach Jesus while he is teaching in the temple. Look at verse 23 again. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the teachers of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Notice it says, the chief priests and the elders of the people. These were incredibly powerful men in Israel. They were influential. They came from powerful families. They graduated from the best rabbinical schools. Uh, they were the top scholars in the Bible. You remember actually a few weeks ago now, we were talking about um, the various levels of Jewish education. And by the time that these men, who became the, the chief priests and elders of the people, had got, come to their position, I mean, these guys are truly the, the highest of the high of intelligentsia. They are the most powerful men in the entire country. And among the smartest men in the entire country, especially when it comes to the Bible, theology, uh, uh, memorization. Almost certainly all of them had memorized the entire Torah and uh, Haftorah and the, the, the whole Old Testament. They knew it like the back of their hands. And so they come to Jesus and they ask him, um, who gave you the right to be doing these things? Now, I think it's really interesting uh, because what are they referring to? Um, doing what things? Uh, look at verse 14 in our text in Matthew 21. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them, but when the chief priests and the scribes, these chief priests, these are the same ones, when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And so they come to Jesus, who gave you the authority to heal blind people? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's like the most ludicrous question maybe ever asked from human lips. Who gave you the authority to make paralyzed lame people get up and walk again? Oh, well, I don't know. Who do you think? You know. And what authority are you doing these things, Jesus? So these were, like I said, the top scholars. They held positions of great importance. They were men who they themselves had authority bestowed on them by other men in authority who came before them. And these Jewish authorities did not like Jesus. As we saw earlier in this chapter, they were indignant toward him. They didn't like what he was doing. And so just like the prior accounts we have read in Matthew's Gospel, where the Pharisees tried to test Jesus in order to trap him, these men attempted the same thing. Our text says that while Jesus was teaching, they came up to him and asked their questions. Look at that. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching. They interrupted the Lord of glory. What chutzpah, what audacity was displayed by these mere men. It is absolutely breathtaking 
They dared to interrupt the Lord of glory as he is teaching in the temple and giving his people the words of life. I mean, if somebody, which, you know, this is not an invitation for you to do this, but if somebody suddenly, you know, came up to me while I'm giving my sermon right now, stood up in the middle of the church and came over and said, hey, I have a question for you. All of you would look at that person and say, what are you doing? Why would you interrupt the preacher like that? And who am I? I'm nobody. I'm nobody. That they would do this to Jesus, stop him, from speaking. I mean, I think of Romans chapter 3 when it's talking about the final judgment and Paul writes in Romans 3 that every mouth shall be stopped. In other words, that on, on that day of judgment, no one's going to be able to interrupt the Lord ever again. Their mouths will be stopped. They won't be able to do what they did here. Hmm. What should they have done? They should have been like Mary, like Lazarus' sister, and quietly come and sat down at Jesus' feet with the rest of the crowd and learned from him. If they would have done that, he would have said to them, Ah, you have chosen what is better. Mm, But they didn't. Instead, they impede and intrude on the Holy One of Israel, and they test him by saying, by what authority do you do these things, and who gave you this authority? And so what they're actually doing here is asking Jesus for his credentials. In other words, um, Rabbi, what rabbi did you study under? Are, Are you even licensed to preach? Who gave you the right to give sight to the blind? Do you, do you have your ministry credential, credentials in Judea? Or, or anywhere for that matter? See, in their minds, this is a great question. And it's a great trap. Because they know that Jesus' ministry was never sanctioned by the Sanhedrin. It was never sanctioned by the Jewish authorities. And so if Jesus says in front of the crowd standing there that he has no worldly credentials, then the chief priests and elders will say to the crowd, See, then why should you all listen to this man? None of us have given him the right or authority to come into this temple and start teaching all of you. He doesn't have a degree from the university. He has not graduated from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's not formally educated like we are. Go home. Stop listening to this man. But then on the flip side, if Jesus says that his authority comes from God and that he's God's son, well then they reckon they'll have him for blasphemy. Either way, if he says he has no authority given by men, they've got him. If he says he has authority from God, that he's God's son, they think they've got him. Either way, it's important to understand here what uh, authority means in this context. Authority, in this case, means the right to exercise power or the liberty to do as one pleases. So the question really is, what and who gives you the right to be doing all the things that you have been doing, Jesus? Of course, the Bible itself gives a very clear answer to these questions. At the beginning of the New Testament, the angels proclaim to the shepherds in the field, saying, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's where his authority comes from, because he is the Christ and the Lord. <laughs> John the Baptist later says essentially the same thing when referring to Jesus. He says, one is coming after me whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. And then later, when he sees him for the first time, John the Baptist looks at his cousin and proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Matthew 17, 
Well, on the Mount of Transfiguration, God the Father speaks from the cloud, and he says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Oh, his authority comes from God the Father. God the Father tells the disciples, Peter, James, and John, listen to him. He gives his identity. This is my beloved son. All Jesus has to do is just recount the things that he's been doing. That's all he has to do with these people. He doesn't do so. I mean, we don't even know he need to go any further than that. That's where his authority comes from, from his Father. Not to mention the fact that Christ was, from the beginning, the life of men. The world was created by him and through him and for him and in him all things hold together. That's what Colossians says, that all things hold together in him, even the bodies of those who who are trying to test him here. Their bodies hold together in Christ. They don't acknowledge Christ's authority over them, but just because they don't acknowledge it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. All right? He has absolute authority over every single molecule in the entire universe, even the molecules within the bloodstreams of those who hate him. All things hold together. It is purely contingent upon the grace of Jesus, his benevolent love toward these people, that they didn't simply explode as soon as they asked him that. I mean, if we take Colossians 1 literally, which I think that there's no reason not to, and all things hold together in him, he could just say the word and their molecules would have blown up. For sure. What authority do you do these things? It's like asking, you know, how are you keeping my body together right now? <laughs> just shocking. Shocking the audacity of these men. The energy of Christ literally sustains every single thing in the entire universe. He, he has sustained your life. Not CrossFit, all right? Not the, the food that you've even eaten today, which is provided by God. He's the one that provides it for you. See, he has sustained you. He has given you everything that you need in order to come to this place at this time in your life. Right now, here, today, Father's Day, today, you're in this room because Christ has sustained you and he, in his infinite uh, authority and his eternal decree has brought you to this place. Right this very moment, he has. He has. He has authority over everything. He holds the title deed to the universe. It's all his to do with as he pleases. And his authority stands regardless of whether it is acknowledged by sinners this side of the judgment or not. Though to deny this fact is silly. To deny his authority is ridiculous. I, as I was thinking about this, meditating on this passage, I, I just thought about... Those people, you know, I, I almost never talk about politics here from the pulpit, but, but I think it's always funny when there are people who say like this, Donald Trump is not my president. Like, yes, he is. <laughs> I mean, you, you might not like the fact that he's your president, but he is the president. Like, what, what do you mean he's not your president? If you're a citizen of this country, he absolutely is. All right, like there was an election, and it, he did win it, and he is the president. What you're really saying by that is, I don't like the fact that he's the president. That's what a person is saying. But that's a much different thing than he's not the president. No, 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 he absolutely is. 
These people might not like the fact that Jesus is the Lord and the King of Kings. They don't like the fact that he has authority, but they can't truly and honestly deny his authority because they've seen him exhibit his authority. They've seen him exhibit it by touching blind people and them seeing again. Right? He has authority over blindness. He has authority over lameness. He has authority over death by raising Lazarus from the dead. He has authority. They just don't like the fact that he has authority. That's the problem. And you know, honestly, I really think that's, I think that the Bible teaches in Romans 1 that that is actually the problem with every unbeliever. Every unbeliever knows that there's a God. They know it. They can see it from what has been made. They see God's hand in all of creation. They just don't like the fact that there's a God. There's no, truly, there's no such thing as a true atheist. No such thing. Because God has set eternity in the hearts of men. Every man knows that there's a God. He just doesn't like the fact that there's a God because the fact that there's a God means you're going to have to give account to the one who's in authority over you. And Christ has intrinsic authority. He has authority, authority in himself. He has self-evident authority. Now, his authority is intrinsic by the nature of who he is. He is the Son of God. He is the Creator God. And it's self-evident by the nature of what he does. Um, who else can open the eyes of the blind, make the lame walk, raise the dead, command the elements of nature, <laughs> like be in a boat, say to the wind and the waves, be quiet, be still. And the text says, they obey him. I mean, if that, if that doesn't show authority, I don't know what does. I think it's amazing, actually, that inanimate objects acknowledge Christ's authority more often than rebellious sinners do. You think about that now. The whole creation acknowledges Christ's authority. It's only rebellious sinners that don't. And he has the right to exercise power and liberty to do as he pleases. It's self-evident. Also, Christ has the authority to preach the Sermon on the Mount. To, to say, I mean, only he can say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, wow. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing, all right? You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you that if you are angry at your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. I say to you, if you have lust, if you've ever lusted after a woman, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Christ has the authority to interpret the law and apply the law because he is the giver of the law. That's why, because he's the one that made that law. He is the lawgiver. Mm. Jesus proves his intrinsic authority in Matthew chapter 9, mm. verses 1 to 8. I just think this is such a beautiful passage. I just want to read it to you. Matthew 9. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise and walk. Let me pause right there. You remember as uh, probably a year ago or more when I was preaching this passage, we talked about which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? I mean, which would be easier for us to say? It would be much easier for us to say, hey, your sins are forgiven. All right, why? Because I don't have the power to tell you to get up and walk. 
I don't have the authority to do that. It's much easier for me to say that your sins are forgiven because then nobody really knows whether or not my sins really are forgiven or if they aren't. I can still say that, though. But look at what Jesus says. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. You see, the amazing irony of that text is this. It was actually much easier for Christ to say to that man, rise and pick up your mat and go home, than to say your sins are forgiven. Infinitely easier for Christ to do that. Because in order for Christ to say your sins are forgiven, he had to die on the cross. But he proves his authority beyond the shadow of a doubt by doing something that no one else could ever do unless they had the authority from God to be able to do it. I.e., make a man who's brought in on a mat come down through the ceiling to get up and walk again. He shows it. He has this authority in himself. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who of course is my favorite, you know that. Read everything you can from Martin Lloyd-Jones. Get every book of his, you know, he's a sinner and his writings are not equal to scripture, but he's great. He's my favorite. He's impacted my life more than any other person outside the Bible when it comes to the faith. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, we see that the whole of the New Testament from Acts to Revelation is the outworking of Christ's statements, I will build my church, and all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. Why does he say that? Teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, because he has authority to command us. And really, friends, that's all I can do as a preacher is to teach you to observe what Christ has commanded us. That's all I can do as a preacher is point you to Jesus Christ. I have nothing to say otherwise. If you come to this church and you say, I, I really want to come and hear a, a preacher who has great anecdotes, I don't have that many of those. If you say, I, I want to hear a preacher who gives us his philosophy of how to be a better dad. I don't know how to be a better dad. I'm working on it myself. I don't have a worldly philosophy to give you. I have no authority in that regard. All I can and must do is show you Christ and teach you to observe all that Christ has commanded because he's the one, he's the one who has any authority. I don't. The only time I ever have authority at all is when I'm speaking Christ's words to you. When I'm expounding what Christ is telling you. That's it. And any time, God forbid, if I ever went against what Christ is saying from this pulpit, I would have no authority whatsoever. Christ is the one with authority. All I can do is show you Him. That's it. That's it. Do you know him? Do you acknowledge his authority over everything in your life? Are you holding things back and saying to the Lord, Lord, you can have authority over all of this part of my life, but I'm going to have my own authority, which contradicts yours, over this little section of my life here. I'll give you everything else, but not this. I want authority over this. You can have authority over everything else. It doesn't work like that. doesn't work like that. You can't say, Lord, I give you all authority over my time. I give you authority over my job. I give you authority over my 
choices of what school I'm at or even X, Y, Z, but I'm, I'm not going to give you authority over my secret sexual life. I'm not going to give you authority over what I do with my money. I want to have sovereignty over that. I want to have authority over those things. You can have everything else. Oh, Scripture addresses that too. It says you cannot serve two masters. You cannot be the master of yourself, and Christ also is the master of you. No, no. No, no. Jesus says then to those people, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? He must have authority over every aspect of our lives, over everything, over all of our choices, over all of our actions. He is preeminent. He is first. Is he first to you? You see, Christianity is Christ. It's not a philosophy. Indeed, it's primarily not even a religion. It's the good news that God has visited and redeemed his people. And that he's done so by sending his only begotten son into the world to live and to die and to rise again. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the, the Omega, the first and the last. In other words, he is the one authority. And so how might we expect Jesus since he is those things? And I, since I've spent the majority of our time so far just showing that Christ is the one in authority, that the answer to his question is that to, the, to their questions, is that he has authority over everything because he's God and God's son. You know, because, because he's in the temple, which was built for him. I mean, it's like, it's like if I was, you know, at home watching the television and I changed a channel and the cleaning lady says, who gave you authority to change a channel? Like, what, lady? This is my house. What are you talking about? Right? That's a terrible example. <laughs> it's just a terrible example. See, I didn't. That's why I, I need to not go off of my notes because I just thought of that. <laughs> hmm. He has authority. This is his house. Who gave you authority to teach in the temple? What? How might we expect Jesus to answer these men? I know how I would have answered them. With a display of authority over their lives by calling down fire from heaven. <laughs> um, but that's because I need more sanctification. Um, <laughs> instead, instead, Christ exhibits such brilliance in his reply that the brilliance of his reply alone testifies to his authority and to his identity. It's incredible. No one could ever write this stuff. I mean, I'm serious. Just the, the scripture's testimony about itself, the, the inward testimony of the Bible is so profound, it proves itself. I know there are some who say, oh, that's circular reasoning. I don't care that they say that. It does prove itself. Because no one is so brilliant as Christ. No one. No one is so brilliant as him. What does he say? He says this. I will ask you one question. <laughs> I will ask you one question. If you answer me, then I will answer you. See, all Jesus needs is one question to just destroy, to obliterate their entire scheme that these most brilliant men, maybe in the whole world, definitely in the land of Israel, like the most brilliant minds came up with the best scheme they could to trap Jesus, and he takes one question to demolish them all. And I mean, and it's on the fly. Like, 
You think about even that. It's so amazing. You remember that, that kid that just won in Jeopardy like 38 games or whatever, James Holzhauer? He's so quick with the buzzer. Like, bzz, 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 bzz. But, he, you know, but he was beaten, though. Like, Jesus, if he ever played Jeopardy, would never lose. <laughs> He's so brilliant. And I, and I mean, I, I like... Even just saying, like, Jesus is so brilliant. I feel like even just saying that somehow lowers the brilliance of Christ. Because he's beyond brilliant. He is all-knowing. He's omniscient. You can't trap him. Look at all the times they try to trap him. Look at it. Hmm, should he pay taxes to Caesar or not? Bring me a coin. Whose picture on it is on it? Caesar's. Get to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God. Like, who can answer in that way? Only Jesus. All right, let's get into Jesus' answer. What does he say? Wow. He says, uh, I, Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why didn't you believe him? If we say from man, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. Notice in verse 24, the brilliance of Christ. He confutes the wisdom of the wise. He answers a fool according to his folly, lest these people look wise in their own eyes. These wannabe wise guys are trying to undermine and trap wisdom personified. And with one question, he crushes their premise. Look at verse 25 again. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? Jesus is asking, whose authority was John the Baptist acting under? What credentials did John have? Was he a true prophet or not? This is a simple question that has actually really huge ramifications for the religious leaders. These leaders already did not like John because in Matthew 3, when he was baptizing in the Jordan and saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, he called them what? A brood of vipers. They don't like that guy. We see it even in their huddle, when they huddle together here, they're saying, the people hold that he's a prophet. In other words, they don't hold that he's a prophet. They just know that the people do. They didn't want to believe in John because John said something about them that they felt was mean. They were a brood of vipers. And he warned them to flee from the wrath to come. So these guys get into a huddle to come up with their response to Jesus' question. I can almost just imagine it here, like Jesus is teaching the people. The people are all there. And these, this group of guys comes up to them, uh, excuse me, where do you get this authority from? Who gave you this authority? And Jesus stops his teaching. He looks at them. He says, uh, I'll ask you one question. John's baptism, from heaven or from man? Which one? And then they like, hey, let's go over here. Like, like, I can hear the Jeopardy theme song in the background. <laughs> and I, and I, I would, you know, using sanctified imagination, I, I, I can almost imagine Jesus being like, How long do you think it's going to take for them to answer the simple question, guys? <laughs> right? He's standing there, just waiting for them. They have to huddle together like, okay, how are we going to answer this one? This is not a hard question at all. They're being purely manipulative. But Jesus' question actually has them in a bind. See, if they say John was a prophet of God who spoke God's words who is doing God's actions, that his baptism was something that God wanted him to do, then Jesus will say, why didn't you listen to him? See, not just regarding what John testified about Jesus, 
that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but also what he said about them. You see how they're trapped now. How they're totally trapped. If they say, yes, John is a prophet, then the prophet of God, by their own admission, has called them a brood of vipers. Whoa. By saying that John was a prophet, they condemn themselves. Themselves. But if they say that he spoke and acted of his own accord, they would lose the support of the people, including the massive crowd standing there, because all of those people knew that John was a prophet. And they would have considered the chief priests and elders to be blaspheming God and his work through John the Baptist. Oh, how the table so quickly turned. With just one question. These egg-headed intellectuals were confounded by Jesus. And after they huddled, they gave the only answer which they believed would protect them. Look at verse 27. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you mean you don't know? What do you mean you don't know? Everyone standing there knew. I mean, what a cop-out. They thought that they would trap Jesus, but they fell into their own trap. If these most eminent scholars and religious leaders in Israel, listen now, if these most eminent Bible scholars, who are supposed to be the ones with discerning minds, who are supposed to be the ones who are able to tell the people, look, what this guy's saying is good and true, and what that guy over there is saying is bad and not true, they're supposed to be able to know the difference between what is godly and what is not godly. That's the reason they're in the position that they're in. That's why they're there. If they don't know if what John was doing was from God or not, how could they ever be trusted to discern whether anything is from God? How could they ever be trusted ever again? You see what they did? They stuck their foot in their own mouth. They can't even tell if John the Baptist is a godly man, is a man who's under God's authority. Jesus says John the Baptist is the greatest man ever born of a woman, of course, excluding himself. I mean, for Jesus to say that, that John the Baptist was the greatest man ever born of a woman, it should be pretty obvious to anyone who's a believer in God, that John the Baptist is who he says he is, the forerunner of the Messiah. That he came from God to make the path straight. And yet these men, see, that's the, that's the, uh, the wild part about it that they do know the answer. They just say they don't know in order to save their own necks, but even in their answer saying we don't know, they shoot themselves in the foot. That's what I mean. Jesus is like beyond brilliant. And since they just proved their own spiritual ineptness Jesus tells them that he won't answer their question. Why should he? You can't even tell me if John is from God or not. Why should I answer your question under what authority am I acting? Hmm. Why is he going to throw pearls to pigs, in other words? This is another moment in the gospel where the Lord proves his own wisdom and his adversary's foolishness. So then... What can we learn from this account? First, the Lord knows the schemes of man. 
He knows man's heart. We cannot trick him or trap him or hide from him. Our only recourse with the Lord, their only recourse with the Lord would have been humble confession of sin. Coming to the Lord and saying to him. If they would have come to him and said, Lord, you know what? You're right. We've been against you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive us. Have mercy on us. We're religious leaders and we don't even know the Lord standing right in front of us. Have mercy, Lord. If they would have done that, they would have been forgiven. They would have been saved. But instead they did the opposite. And now they stand for all time in the scriptures as a warning to us not to be hypocrites. They're here in the scriptures as a warning to us. It's a warning to me. Because, you know, I'm a quote-unquote religious leader. Right? I must know the one whom I am proclaiming. Secondly, they should have been like their friend Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. In John chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, it says this. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This is an elder. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Amen. Look at that. Oh, snap. They didn't even have to go to Jesus to ask the question, whose authority are you doing these things by? All they had to do was go to Nicodemus and whoever was, quote-unquote, with Nicodemus. Because what does Nicodemus say? He says, teacher, we know. So there's at least one more person. Maybe Joseph of Arimathea. I don't know. There's Nicodemus and maybe a small group of the Pharisees. They, he says to Jesus at night. Why does he go at night? Because it's suicide for him to go during the daytime where these wretched, wicked men could see him do that. He goes to Jesus at night, and he acknowledges the truth about him. He says, look, in essence, there's some of us. We know that you are come from God. We know it. Because no one could do the things that you're doing unless God was with him. That's the answer to these rulers' question. That's it right there. And I declare to you today what Nicodemus declared. Jesus is from God. Indeed, Jesus is the Son of God. No one could do the things that Jesus did unless God were with him. Oh, they should have been like Nicodemus. Third, since Jesus has all authority, I, I learned that to be as accurate as possible in my preaching. I want to always be careful and accurate. Once R.C. Sproul, when he was alive, was on a, uh, a panel, and someone said something to him in, in a question, like question it, thousands of people out in the audience, and someone asked R.C. Sproul a question, um, if God is sovereign over everything, and R.C. Sproul stopped him and said, I have to stop you right there. Since God is sovereign over everything, all right, go on with your question. <laughs> that's right that's right okay uh yeah we don't say like if god is sovereign no 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 since since jesus has all authority here's the question for you do you acknowledge his authority over your life do you acknowledge it don't call him lord lord and not do what he says. If you acknowledge his authority over your life, then obey him. Obey what he commands. You know, the first thing that he commands? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. 
Repent and believe. If you don't know him, then repent and believe. Believe. Acknowledge his authority over everything. You know, thank God. Thank God for Jesus. Because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That is simply the truth about who he is. But he also exercises his kingly authority in love. Our Savior and God is not a tyrant. He loves. He loves sinners. He's a friend to sinners. Oh, thank God for Jesus. I can't imagine what it would be like to live in North Korea under a tyrant like Kim Jong-un. Can you imagine it? How awful that would be? Jesus isn't like that. He isn't like that. He is a king who exercises his authority in love. He cares about each of us. He cares about you. And he's worthy for us to acknowledge and to obey and to bow the knee to. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful love displayed to us by sending your Son, Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to humble himself and become a servant. To be born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for the grace and love that you've shown to us. We thank you so much for the authority of Christ. For truly, that is actually a great hope for us as well. Because you have authority, that means also you will make all things right. You have the power to make all things right. You have authority over life and death, over the future. And we want to acknowledge that now, Lord. Help us to do so ever more fully. In Jesus' name, amen.